Welcome to the International Word Center. We are so glad you could join us for a fresh upload of the Word of God. So get your pad or paper, get your pen, your pencil, whatever you want to use, uh, your Bible, your flair. If anybody knows what that is out there, uh, you know what it is. Uh, so let's just get into the Word of God today. But before we do, on just behalf again of uh, Helen and me, my wife and I, we just want to say thank you for joining the International Word Center uh, just supporting us by listening to what God has given us to say, supporting us with your prayers, supporting us with your talents, uh, those who have given to help the ministry with their time and talents, uh, also with your treasure, treasures, with your giving. And we'll give you a little bit more on that if you want to get in on helping us do what God has called us to do. And you say, what is that? It's to propagate, to preach and teach the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ and to build the body of Christ up to cause believers everywhere all over this globe, wherever Internet can be accessed or wherever, you know, we hold different meetings to be mature, to be readily responsive to God, his word and his spirit so that we can do what Father God has called us to do and we can be what God has called us to be. It's time out for just religious activity and church as usual, but it's time for the sons of God. That means men and women, sons of God to rise up and represent the Father well in planet Earth, not just in character, in love and those type of thing, but also in power. The Christianity, it, the, the big difference between Christianity and any other quote unquote religion is power. It's the only teachings that I know of when it comes to spiritual things or in religious circles that talk about raising from the dead, that talk about casting out devils, that talk about healing and deliverance and signs and miracles, because that is the God we talk about here and the God we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that created this whole universe with a spoken word. So if you're looking for truth, you're in the right place. Not because I say so, but if you do the word of God, you'll find out that is true. So stay tuned, come back often, go to our uh, website at iwordcenter.org, our YouTube channel, uh, Rick Washington under my name. So before we get into today's teaching, we always have to make room for the Holy Spirit. And the best way to do that is yield ourselves to God in prayer. And we like to just offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for some time, some moments here to acknowledge God that we believe he exists and that we believe he stands ready to respond to us. Are you ready? Come on, just lift your hands with me today, whatever time of day or night that you're listening to this, just act like it's fresh off the press because when you do that, it will be. Put your confidence in God right now that he sees you, he knows you, he's for you, he's not against you, he loves you, and he wants to help you and minister to you whatever area you need help. So Father, we thank you right now in advance. We thank you for your love, God. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that gives us the right to expect to be able to come into your presence and ask from you, to receive from you, to fellowship with you, to commune with you. Thank you, God, for right standing through and by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making it all possible that we can have fellowship with you and the Father. Thank you, God, for the precious gift of your spirit, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Oh, we just yield all our faculties to you right now, and we thank you, Father God, for your presence in our lives, not just with us, but in us. We thank you, Father, for your word and revelation of it. We thank you, God, for the gifts of the Spirit flowing in our lives, in our home, in the workplace, in ministry, in the marketplace. We thank you, Father God, for the provision you've given, given us, meeting all our needs, or those who are having needs to be met today. We thank you, God, for showing up strong in their behalf. We thank you for healing mercies, God. We thank you for health, God. We thank you for soundness in our mind. We thank you, God, for restoration in relationships. We thank you for healthy, rest, uh, healthy relationships. We thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness toward us. We judge you faithful today and we declare in Jesus name, say this with me. We judge God faithful that what he says, he always does. There's no blame in you, Father God. If you promised it, you bring it to pass. You make it good. In Jesus name, we pray. Somebody shout amen. And again, as we said, we want to invite you to join us in this endeavor of 
doing God's will, building up the body of Christ, but also the second part of the assignment here at the International Word Center for Helen and I is also to promote the fivefold ministry. Say, so what is the fivefold ministry? It's found in the book of Ephesians that when Jesus went on high, he left gifts to men. And those gifts are in men and women. And what are those giftings? Are those special endowments, those abilities uh, to do spiritual things? It's the apostle. And one day we'll teach on all these. It's the teacher, it's the pastor, it's the evangelist, and it's the prophet. We as the body of believers need all of them. For the most part, most people that attend church uh, get exposed to maybe one or two or three of those uh, offices uh, the pastor for sure, the teacher, yes, and, and sometimes the evangelist. But most believers don't get exposed to the prophet or the apostle. Uh, many don't believe they exist anymore, that there were only the 12 or 13, if you, you know, count the one that was added after Judas, you know, betrayed the Lord. But those gifts have not gone away. They are still here. They may be labeled wrong, and we'll get into that teaching one day so you can begin to identify that because the advantage of being exposed to the five-fold ministry is it, it is necessary to help you to mature where you get a good 360 degree view of what God is like, who he is and what he is and how he does things. Amen. So let's get into the word today. But if you want to get in on the given, just go to the website, iwordcenter.org. Click on the donate button at the top. If you prefer mailing something in, there is also a mailing address at the bottom of any page. That's iwordcenter.org. Uh, let me pray for those who have given or are getting ready to give also. And I'm just going to release my faith. So you release your faith, not in me, not in the ministry, but in Father God, that he's the one that will do the work. He's the one that will cause you to be blessed. And I just want to pray specifically for your finance. If you don't need any money, <laughs> that's fine. Amen. Bless somebody with what you already have. But God wants you to have more than enough. So that through us, through him, we can not only just be his eyes and his hands and his feet that we often hear, but he also want, wants to work through us and be a blessing in the earth. To be able to bless people with food, pay for their houses, pay for their cars, pay off this, pay off that, make their house note for them. Whatever God instructs you to do, to throw a banquet for somebody. Are you listening to me? Get some clothes, take some kids shopping for uh, back to school or for, for the holidays, those that don't have. But you can't do that if you don't have your needs met or you're broke. Now there's a time to be sacrificial and give up something that belongs to you for someone else. But God wants you abundantly blessed where you can have more than enough so that you can be blessed to be a blessing. So you can be a great testimony walking around with nice clothes, dressing well, living well, driving well. Amen. God wants, I don't care where you live. I don't care what continent you are on. God is able to bless you where you are. So let me pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see each and every person that is purposing in their hearts to honor you and be not just a blessing to this ministry, but to any of your righteous causes. And I lift them up now, God. I ask that you, Lord, would show them where their wealthy places are and where their divine connections are. I say, angels of the Lord, go that have been assigned to minister for us and bring us into our wealthy places and into our divine connection. Father, I pray that you, God, would move by your spirit and give us witty ideas and inventions and investments and businesses to go into. In Jesus' name, God, we ask for prosperity to come now on all of us, God, that is under the sound of my voice. I will listen to this in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Say, God, I thank you for prosperity now. Just believe you receive it and expect God to begin to influence your thinking that you've got to act on it now. God has promised that he will bless whatever you put your hands to. God has promised the measure you give out, it will be given back to you. Just like a farmer, you play a part. You don't make the seed grow, 
but you play a part. You've got to sow, you've got to water, you've got to protect and nurture, and then you have to harvest. So it's harvest time for some of you. And the way you harvest is you go out into the field and put your hands to something. You invest in something. Are you listening to me? God wants you to prosper. Prosperity means to succeed. God wants you to succeed. He doesn't want you to fail. I'm reminded of the word of God in Luke 11 chapter. It said, you've been imperfect parents as you are, some translations say evil, but you being imperfect as you are, you want to treat your children well, don't you? If it's in your power to bless your children, whatever it may be, you will do it or give it to them. God has all power. Glory to God. He can cause things to go in your favor wherever you go. So just receive it and believe it. Well, let's get into the word today. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, talking about this. We're in this series. It's about the seventh week, I believe, seventh or eighth week. We've been talking on the subject of God's will. It's so important as believers that we know God's will and walk in God's will because God won't get involved in your activities if it's not something he has chosen for you to do or be. And that's what we mean when we say God's will. It's what God's plan is. It's what God's choice is. And we talked about it's so important to know God's will before we do God's will. A lot of religious uh, settings I've heard and when I first got born again is that we prayed for God's will. But the Bible actually teaches it's nothing wrong to ask for God's will. But the Bible teaches just as much, if not more so, that we need to know God's will. Because in 1 John 5, 14, it says, when we pray according to God's will, we know he hears us and we get an answer. The scripture is clearly saying here that God expects us to know what he values, what he chooses, what his plans, what his will is. Come on. So that we can ask for it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for another opportunity to be used by you and bring you glory. We ask God for your anointing, the inspiring of your spirit on my spirit. Give me the right words to teach and preach with today, God. Let them be confirmed with signs and wonders, God. Let the gifts of the spirit flow, God. Minister to us in such a way that it's un undeniable that we've heard from you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. So we've talked about basically what uh, the slight review I did there that we first of all have to go to the word of God to find out the will of God because and to do that, like second Timothy three and 16 said, uh, one of our foundational scriptures, we first have to believe that every scripture, everything in that Holy Bible is God breathed, that it's inspired by God, and that those scriptures, those teachings, New Testament, Old Testament, that we can use them for training in righteousness, in holy living, to come into conformity to God's will and our thought, purpose, and action. And that's what being in the will of God is. Or having God's will in your life is not automatic, it's something you have to find out and be a doer of it or yield yourself to it or allow it to be in your life. You have to learn to think like God thinks. You have to have the same purpose that God has, the same motivation. You, your actions, your deeds, uh, your speech need to be what God would do, what God would say. For we are imitating and following Jesus. And Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father say and I only do what I see the Father doing. You say, well, where do we find this at? How do we know God's plan? I, I've been praying and asking God for his will. I, like I said, when it comes to specific things, like who you should marry, where you should move to, should you take this job or that job? Yeah, yeah, you can ask God to give you direction. You can ask God for wisdom. And we taught on that a couple of teachings ago about the specific things. But most of your life is not made up of specific things. Matter of fact, if you fit into God's will, oh yes, and when you fit into God's God's will in the general sense, you automatically will fit in, or should I say, you will more easily and more readily be able to identify those specific things that God's plan and choosing is for you. Let me say that again. Somebody write it down while well, I'm recording it. When you get a good understanding and grasp of the general will of God, then when it comes to the specific things 
of the, for the will of God in your life, like who you should marry, where you should work, where you should buy your house or buy what should I buy this car? When you're walking in the general will, and what I mean by the general will, that plan, that purpose, that choosing of God that applies to every believer. Hallelujah. Then when it comes to the things you need to know or ascertain or, or come to the knowledge of the specific things in life, you, it will make, you will be in a great position to more readily be able to choose and identify, do I go left or do I go right? Do I marry this person or pass? <laughs> Amen. Uh, so uh, one of our foundation scriptures, I said in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, if you don't believe that the word of God is inspired by God, the Bible, then you're going to have a hard time finding God's will for your life because we find God's will through the Father as he's revealed in the Bible, how he is and how he responds, what he likes, what he dislikes, what he, what he loves and what he uh, cheers on. <laughs> Are you listening to me? We find the will of God through the Son of God. When you read the Bible and see how Jesus acted and reacted and responded, Jesus was the very expressed image of the Father. He told Philip, when you see me, you've seen the Father. Are you listening to us here? I know you are. Just listen a little closer. We find the will of God through the word of God. Amen. We also find and discover God's will, how he is, what he chooses, what he values, uh, what he esteems, what he allows or disallows, what he calls right, what he calls wrong. When we, we find the will of God also with the help of the Holy Spirit. When we get filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come into our life, Amen. According to Luke eleven thirteen, 13, when you ask for the Holy Spirit to come into your life, he fills you. And Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit has come, he will lead you into all truth. He will show you things to come. He will teach you. He will encourage you. He will help you to pray uh, in a language that's a heavenly language, talking to God. Uh, many translation interpreted or translated as tongues that the Holy Spirit comes to your aid and helps you to know what the will of God is. Now, it's our part to find out the will of God, not just to get in a proverbial uh, canoe without a pedal and whichever way the canoe ends up or whichever way it goes and ends up, we call it the will of God. No, the will of God can be discovered by you and by me to where we can prove for ourselves. Romans, the 12th chapter tells us, verse one and two, tells us that we can prove for ourselves what is the good acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's three things we do to learn how to do that, uh, uh, to, to prove what God's will is for our lives. One, you got to live holy. You can't live a sinful lifestyle and discover God's will. Two, you got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's learning how to think the way God thinks. And that happens when you meditate in the word of God. And then three, you can't be conformed to this world. You have to be on guard on what you allow to go into your spirit, what ideologies, what, what customs, what philosophies, what opinions, you have to guard your heart and use the word of God, amen, as your uh, litmus test or as your filter of what you should let come in. If it doesn't agree with the word of God and the Holy Spirit will help you in these areas to determine what is of God and what is not of God. We're still doing a little bit review and, and talking about the importance as believers if we're going to walk in God's will and see God's will done in our lives and through our lives for others, we've got to know God's will. Amen. Ephesians 5, 17 tells us, therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and listless or foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the father is. When we find the will of God through uh, understanding father God through what he's revealed to us, through his word, when we meditate in the word of God and when we learn to yield to the Holy Spirit, we will come to know the will of God. And we've been talking about some general things and some specific things. And today we want to get into another portion of that on God's will is to love. Amen. Say that with me. God's will is to love because when you begin to understand that it's the will of God for you to love. It's not something that you can set on the side that it's, it's, it's mandatory. It's a commandment. When you don't understand about walking in love, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but I want you to 
put your attention to me fully so that you can understand that this topic that we're talking, teaching on today with the help of the Holy Spirit can answer a bunch of your questions. What's the will of God for my life? What's the will of God for my marriage? What's the will of God for my business? What's the will of God for my children? What's the will of God on my job? What's the will of God for my ministry? What's the will of God, et cetera, et cetera, whatever, fill in the blanks that when you learn and understand that God's will is steeped in walking in love, when you begin to walk in love, you will walk in God's will. Because the word of God tells us in 1 John 4 and 8, he who does not love has not become acquainted with God. He does not and never did know him, never knew God. That's a biggie for God is love. If you're not walking in love in every area of your life, then you don't know God. And if you don't know God, how are you going to know his will? You've got to learn to know God. You got to know how he is. You got to see what he's doing, as Jesus says, so you can do it. You got to behave like God would behave. You got to respond like God would respond. And your faith won't work if you're not walking in love. And faith is the only way we can receive from God. It's the only way we can please God. Amen. So get on board with me today with the Holy Spirit as we walk down this road of teaching God's will is to walk in love. Amen. Now, I want to throw this, the Lord put this in my heart earlier today as I was meditating on it, that we need to put this uh, disclaimer, for lack of better words, in the forefront of this teaching before we get into actual, the nitty gritty of walking in love, which is God's will. God's will for you and me is to walk in love, to walk in love, to live in love. Come on, are you listening to me? But walking in love doesn't mean that you accept everything that everybody has. In other words, if somebody's living a sinful lifestyle, uh, they're living a homosexual lifestyle or whatever the case be, or they're living a, a, a lifestyle of a drunkard lifestyle or immorality, sleeping around, all that, all that goes into the same bucket. It's a sinful lifestyle. If they're, if they're, uh, stealers and liars. Uh, amen. Now that, now listen to me, how do, how we want to say it? Let's say, here's what God says. God says, come as you are, but God doesn't expect you to change, expect you to stay as you are. So we, as believers, we need to imitate the father and say, yeah, come on. Uh, come on. I, I, I'll talk to you. I'll be around you. Jesus hung around sinners and, and what have you. But the purpose of it is to give them truth and come to repentance. So love is not tolerance and, and, and coexisting with sinful uh, uh, lifestyles or sinful practices. That's not love. Love, God gave me this definition one time, that love is choosing what's best for yourself and for others. So people that are in sinful lifestyles, we're not just supposed to put up with that and let and just let them if they're in church, let them do whatever they want to do and live however they want to do. I'm not saying you judge them. I'm not saying you be harsh with them, but love will call them to come to repentance. Love will demand a change. God demands a change in each of us. We not, we're not supposed to stay the same. You can come as you are. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You can come as you are, but you can't stay as you are if you're in a sinful lifestyle and practice. What it's called is repentance. I mean, John the Baptist came preaching it in Matthew uh, 3, 6 through 9. It says, bring forth fruit that is consistent with repentance. Uh, Jesus even said in Mark uh, 1 and 15, he said, repent. Have a change of mind, which issues in regret for past sins and in change of a conduct for the better. Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. You can't live and be in the kingdom of God without repentance from your past sins. Having a change. Repentance starts with maybe uh, feeling bad and crying, but that's not repentance. Repentance means change. So in order for you to walk in love, you've got to start with repent. There's power. There's joy in repentance. Repentance is a good thing. You get another chance. But what I'm saying is when you talk about walking in love, the world's philosophy or uh, definition or religion's definition is this kind of weird thing that no matter what people do or how people act, 
you treat them real good. No, no, no. Jesus even beat them out the temple when they defamed and dishonored the house of prayer. Are you listening to me? He didn't just let them stand there and continue to do what they did. He ran them out. Uh, Jesus even told the woman caught in adultery, uh, I forgive you, but don't go do it no more. Uh, even over in the book of Corinthians, I believe 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, somewhere around there, uh, where, uh, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, where the man in uh, the church of Corinthians was committing immorality that wasn't heard of, even with unbelievers, that he was sleeping with his stepmama. And Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, say, put him out for the destruction of his body. Least he come back to repentance and his soul would be saved. In other words, he wouldn't go to hell, eternal judgment. So what we're saying here is when we talk about walking in love, walking in love is choosing what's best for someone. Amen. And that does not always mean, you know, polishing their shoes, letting them stay in the house and they're 45 years old, bringing their girlfriends over. Are you listening to me? That, that was, loving somebody is not knowing they're stealing and uh, looking the other way because you don't want to get them fired. Are you listening to me? Walking in love is means doing what's best for them, making the best choice for them. And for some time, sometimes that means making those choices that sometimes is hard, but it's the right choice so that they can be brought to repentance. Repentance is a good thing. Repentance means change. God wants you to come as you are, but God expects you to change. He expects you to repent. Somebody say amen. So that's just a little disclaimer. So when we talk about love, we're not talking about this weird uh, love that tolerates and accepts everything. No, love, God is love and God is holy. God is blameless and he cannot fellowship with sin. Hallelujah. That's as far as God is concerned, the judgment of sin has been satisfied uh, with the sacrifice and the pouring out of Jesus's life and his resurrection. But God still hates sin. So, amen. So let's get into the word a little bit more. Uh, let's see. Look at the book of Ephesians. Go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. God's will, say it with me, God's will is to walk in love. If, if you want to see things change in your life for the better in any and every area of your life, walk in love. Learn to walk in love. It's God's will that you walk in love. Yes, in the tough situations, in the hard situations. Amen. To walk in love. For Ephesians 5, uh, verse 1 through 2, it says out of the Amplified Bible says, Therefore, talking to you, talking to me, therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well beloved children imitate their father and walk in love. You want to be like God. You want to choose what God would choose. You want to love what God loves. You want to hate what God hates. You want to allow what God would allow. You want to disallow what God would disallow. You want to be in God's will. Walk in love. And it goes on to say, esteeming and delighting in one another as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a slain offering and sacrifice to God for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. God is saying here, want to be like me? Imitate me. Walk in love. Look at Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning at the 34th verse. What we're doing right now is highlighting scriptures where God has inspired, showing us that it is his will that we are to walk in love. Amen. We ought to walk in love. Amen. We ought to walk in love. You got it yet? Matthew the 20, 22, begin at the 34th. I'm going to read this out of the TPT Bible. And it says, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they called a meeting to discuss how to trap Jesus. Verse 35. Then one of them, a religious scholar, posed this question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus answered him, love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought 
that is within you. Mm, this is walking in love, loving God this way with everything that's in you. This is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It is not something that uh, you can or not can or cannot do because grace will cover me. No, God is saying if you want to be in God's will, you must walk in love. And it goes on to say, Jesus speaking here in the 28th verse, uh, I mean, 38th verse in Matthew 22 and 38, it says, this is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is like it in importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. It sort of reminds me of uh, the teachings in Corinthians where it talks about a husband and wife relationship where it says that a husband ought to love his wife even as he loves his own flesh. You would never abuse, misuse your own flesh, you know, unless you need deliverance from something. But we're talking about everyday, normal thinking, right thinking people. You would never do anything to hurt your own body of flesh. You nurture your own body. You bathe it. You keep it uh, healthy. You dress it well. You feed it or you, you give it sleep. So in the same way, we as believers to be in God's will, we need to walk in love. And one of the portions of walking in love is to love others as you love yourself. And then it goes on to go. And that goes back to what we said early. Love is choosing what's best for someone. And this is a question I often ask myself when it comes to wanting to tell other people about Jesus and be bold about it and not draw back. If they knew what I knew and I didn't know it, I would want them to tell me about it. Did you catch that? <laughs> and maybe I can try to say it again. If other people knew what I knew and I didn't know it, I would want them to tell me about it. So if you love somebody and you know the truth that Jesus died for their sins, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, amen, that those who would believe on him, that he died in their place and was raised from the dead, they would be saved from eternal punishment, eternal judgment. You, if you love people, you'll tell them about Jesus. Amen. Well, let's go on. And he goes on to say in verse 40, contain within these commandments to love you, to love. Let's try that again. Contained within these commandments to love, you will find all the meaning of the law and prophets. Amen. Amen. So let's look at another scripture. I hope you're getting this because we got so much to cram in today. So stay with me. I'm going a little faster than normal, but I think it's necessary. So you can take these different uh, nuggets of truth and these scriptures and go meditate on them, study them yourself, get your mind renewed to think what the word is saying here today, because it will fast track you to being in the perfect will of God when you learn to walk in the God kind of love. Look at 2 John. Oh, yes, I'll say it, Lord. Some of us are not walking in the perfect blessings that God wants you to have. I'm talking about relationship wise. I'm talking about financially, even health is because of you not walking in this one thing called love. Amen. Take that for what you hear it. Learn to walk in love and it'll solve a lot of the things activities that you're coming up against that seem like you're not getting somewhere, not going somewhere, you're not getting the results you should be getting. It may be this one thing that you need to do today to get into God's will. It's God's will for you, my brother and sister, to walk in love. Second John uh, chapter one, verse six, and it says in the Amplify, and what this love consists in is this, that we live and walk in accordance with and guided by his commandments, God's commandments, his orders, his ordinances, his precepts, his teaching, his ways of doing and being right, his will. This is the commandment, as you have heard from the, from the beginning, that you continue to walk in love, guided by it, guided by it and following it. The word of God is so clear here that in order for you to see God's will in your life, and God's will is a good will. It's, it's, I didn't mean it to come out that way, but his will is good. He has preordained for you to walk in the paths of a good life. Amen. Let's look at what love looks like a little bit before we get out of here today. So you can begin to identify when you're not in it so that you can get in walking in love. And this is not all exhaustive. We're just 
actually introducing you to this idea, to this thought, to this truth, that it just might be you're looking for God's will in any area of your life, and it might be in order for you to find God's will for your life that you need to walk in love. If you want to find the church you should be in, come on. If you want to find the school you should attend, uh, if you're having trouble at home with your siblings or your parents or, or your spouse, it, the, re the, the reason that it is, it could be, would be this one little thing called, it's a big thing, but you understand what I'm saying, is walking in love. If you want to see God's will in your life, if you want to see the blessings, the power of God, the favor of God, the prosperity, the health, come on. All the good things that God says are yours, that belongs to you, to have God's will in your life, you must walk in love. Amen? What love looks like. Love is the will of God. Let's go to the famous, if you've been a Bible student of any time or read the Bible, the book of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, gives us a clear picture of what love looks like. If you're not choosing the things we're getting ready to read, if you're not choosing to live, to think, to speak, to have the purpose of heart of the things that the Bible clearly reveals to us, the way of love, then you're not choosing God's will. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Let's just begin at the first chapter. I mean, the first verse. It says, if we were to speak with elegance, 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. If we were to speak with elegance, oh, I'm reading this out of the TPT translation. If we were to speak with elegance in earth's many languages and, and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. Verse 2. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. This is God talking to you now. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I owned to feed the poor, and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr, without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Now, patient doesn't mean putting up with people. Patient, patient in, in this setting, or in the most scriptural setting, patience means endurance. And the kind of endurance it talks about is you stay the same way no matter what goes on. So parents, quit screaming at your children. If you wanna walk in love, you need to let the Holy Ghost help you to develop this supernatural patience, this God kind of love that you don't fly off the handle, you don't scream at people, you don't get sharp with people, you stay the same way all the time. We see this in our Lord and Savior Jesus all the time. No matter what was going on, the, the man, he was cool, for lack of better words. He didn't get ruffled, he didn't, and he didn't fake it. That's because he was walking in love. When they brought the woman caught in adultery down in front, he didn't go, well, you, you know, he didn't get into no wrangling and no arguing and debating. He just sat down and started writing in the sand, walking in love. He was sleeping the boat walking. He didn't change. He stayed the same way. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be incredibly patient with people. Amen. Uh, and then it goes on to say, love is gentle and consistently kind to all. Don't just be kind to people that can do something for you. Be kind to everybody. The guy that cut you off, let him go ahead. You get to the intersection with four people, let everybody else go. Don't be in such a hurry. Walk in love. And it's these little areas that will allow you to walk in the big areas. If you can't practice love in the little stuff, it's going to be difficult for you to walk in love when something really big comes up where you need to walk in this God kind of love. And it goes on to say, love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. In verse 5, 1 Corinthians 13 and 5, it says, love does not traffic in shame and disrespect. In other words, you don't want to make people feel bad. You don't want to make 
people feel down and out. You don't want to call, say shame on you and you should know better and all that. No, 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 no. Love want to, now I'm, like I said earlier, walking in love don't mean you accept and tolerate people's sin and dis, uh, disbehavior or bad behavior, but it does mean when you're dealing with it, are you listening to me now? You want to walk in love. You want to see them get better. You want to see them come out. You want to see them not get judged. Your purpose and your motivation is to help. So you never want to make people feel bad, even if they've done something to you. Imitate God. Imitate the Lord Jesus that reveals to us the will of God. On the cross, when he was dying, Stephen called it, he was dying. He asked the Father to forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's the kind of God I love. You say, ooh, that's tough, that's hard. You can do it. And I'm going to tell you how in just a moment. There's help. There's help to help you do it. You don't have to do it on your own. God has everything you need to pertain, that pertains to life and to be like him, to be, to be godly, to be just like him. He has given it to you already through the sacrifice of Jesus' shed blood and his resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He will help you to walk in this kind of love. So let's finish. So love is not, uh, love does not traffic in shame and disrespect. Don't try to make people feel bad, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Verse six, love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. Amen. So go back, get those scriptures, get you several translations, get you some concordance, uh, get in the Holy Spirit, pray in the Holy Spirit and read over those scriptures over and over. Meditate on them until you get your thinking transformed because you can't do anything till you first think it. So you got to change how you think about it's okay. It's my personality. It's just my ethnicity. I'm Italian. I'm black. You know, that's just how we roll. You understand what I'm saying? No more. You're born again. If you're in Christ, if you're born into the kingdom of God, if you're a child of God, God's will is you must walk in love time out. No more excuses. Say it with me. No more excuses. No more excuses. I'm walking in love. I'm walking in love. I'm walking in love. Help, help is here to help you do it. As we learn to yield to the Holy Spirit more and more, He, the Holy Spirit, will cultivate in you, in your spirit, and grow in you the God kind of love in you. He will help you. Let me give you a few more scriptures before we get out of here. Look at Romans 5 and 5. If you don't have time to turn there, just write them down because I'm going to go pretty quickly. It says, Romans 5 and 5 says, and God's word translation says, we're not ashamed to have this confidence because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit will put the God kind of love into your spirit. You got to learn to yield to him. One of the number one ways of yielding to the Holy Spirit, if you haven't already, you need to ask for today, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and yield and utter the things he gives you. Speak the words he gives you. It's called speaking in tongues. He gives you words because what will happen when you do that, you're yielding your tongue to the Holy Spirit and it helps him to take control over you. He won't usurp the authority over you. He won't possess you, so to speak. But as you yield to him, he then will energize you in your spirit. He will deposit things into your spirit. He will cultivate those things that are in your spirit, that God kind of love. In Galatians 5 and 22, it gives us a great picture of it and it depicts it as fruit. It says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes is love. And it goes on to talk about a bunch of other fruit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc. But love is at the top of the list. You can't walk in the God kind of love without the help of God. Jesus said it in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you vitally stay in union with me and let my words be in your heart, living in your heart, then you can produce fruit and you can produce this kind of love that is God's will. If you want to walk in God's will, you've got to walk in this God kind of love. Amen. In Philippians 2 and 13, uh, it says, we're talking about the help to walk in this kind of God, God kind of love. 
It's God's will to walk in love. If you want to be in God's will, if you want to see the goodness and the blessings and the promise and the victories that God says you can have, you've got to walk in love. You've got to walk in love. You overcome evil with good. You've got to walk in love. Your faith worketh by love and faith is the way you receive and lay hold of the things from God. In Philippians 2.13 in the Amplified, it says, not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing, creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. The scripture is saying to us that it's, you don't do, you don't learn to live this life just like a branch on a tree cannot produce a fruit, an apple, a pear, an orange, or whatever the case may be on its own. It must be vitally connected to the trunk of the tree and it's the trunk of the tree supplying the power to produce the fruit. The same thing is true here. When we learn to continually yield to the Holy Ghost, he will produce in you right desires and the power to do them. He'll, he'll produce in you the right love, <laughs> amen, and you'll act the way you should act. He'll give you the ability to do it. So when you allow God to work, as we get ready to close, when you allow God to work in you, his kind of love, you then will choose what he would choose. You will then see God getting involved in all your activities because God doesn't get involved in activities he hasn't assigned or co-signed on. In other words, God won't co-sign on your activities that are not his will. And if you're walking outside of love, God's not going to get involved in it. That can explain why some things are a struggle sometime or a lot of times for us as believers. When we don't walk in love, God doesn't get involved with what you're doing. He still loves you. Are you listening to me? But he can't get involved unless you're walking in love. Because as the scripture said over in 1 John, God is love. So when you begin to allow God work in you, his kind of love, you will choose what he would choose. In other words, you'd be in his will. Amen? You'll be in God's will. So as we get ready to close, I want to lead us in a time of prayer. First of all, for those out there who need to repent. Repentance is not crying and feeling bad. Amen. It may start there, but repentance is change. That you allow the Holy Ghost to help you. You allow God to help you to make changes. But it's you have to take the steering wheel and follow what the chauffeur. I know some songs out there say, God, take my steering wheel. Amen. God, be my pilot, not my co-pilot. But the Bible doesn't, it's not set up that way. God will not take over you. He will not override your will, your ability to choose whatever you want. What we need to do, and here's a good picture the Lord gave me, we need to learn to be a good chauffeur. God's in the back and we're driving the car and we need to be attentive and do exactly what the boss say. Are you listening to me? If he say stop, we stop. If he say turn left, we turn left. And when you begin to do that, the Holy Spirit in the back telling you what to do, then you will begin to live a robust, strong, vibrant, fruitful, powerful, loving, kind life. You will be like Jesus. You'll be an imitator of the Father. And a lot of times it begins with repentance, that you make a sharp decision, a sharp de decision to change. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not crying, even though you might. Repentance is not feeling bad, even though you might, but only for a moment. Repentance should be a change. You're going south and the Holy Spirit says, turn around and make a U-turn. You make every effort to make that U-turn and he'll reach over and help you if you're having a little struggle. Amen. So let's pray this today, a prayer of repentance. And then I'm going to lead those out there who have not made Jesus the Lord of their lives, have not uh, given themselves over to God to experience salvation, uh, uh, to freedom from sin and from the tyranny of the devil. I want to lead you in a prayer of salvation. So let's pray this first. And we're basing this on the word of God because we know we cannot ask anything of God if it's not his will and expect the answer. In Romans 15 and 13, it says, May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound and be flowing, bubbling over with hope. And 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, in fact, to be distressed in a godly way causes people to change the way they think, act, 
think and act and leads them to be saved. No one can regret that, but the distress that the world causes brings only death. So when we begin to sense a pang uh, in our spirits and in our minds that we're doing something that would displease God, that will lead you to change, but you still have to make the choice. But the other kind of sorrow or regrets that the world, because you got caught, are you going to have some consequences that brings death? So I want to pray for us and pray with you. So just follow me in this prayer. Say, God, I come before you now in Jesus name and I repent. Now you fill in the blank. I repent of not walking in love. I repent of holding unforgiveness. I repent of practicing sin. I repent. Well, you fill in the blanks, but you make a decisive decision and dedication of your life to God right now to change and he will help you. Amen. Father, I ask that you would help me now to change my way of thinking, my purposes and my deeds in Jesus name. Amen. Now, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, let me tell you why you should. Sin is going to be judged one day. Satan and all his cohorts, the fallen angels, which we call evil spirits now, rebelled against God and sin is lawlessness. Sin is rebelling against God's ways, throwing off his restraints and doing things your own way. Mankind was not created to be judged. They were created in righteousness. They were created right with God. They were created holy and blameless like God, but mankind was given a free will. They could choose whatever they want. And God told them, don't, don't do this one thing. And the Bible depicts it of eating from a tree in the garden. They chose it. They got Eve got deceived and Adam just went and rebelled. And when that happened, God told them the day that you sin, your soul shall die. Now, that's not just a physical death. Eventually that did happen, but physical death and all the miseries you see in life, sickness, disease, weeds and, and chaos and earthquakes, all that came into planet Earth that was paradise because of sin, because death did take place when man sinned. Death in the spiritual sense is separation from God. So mankind and all planet Earth got separated from God. And when we're separated from God, we're separated from all that's good, all that's loving, all that's beautiful, all that's uh, uh, healthy, uh, all the good stuff flows out of God. So when you're disconnected from God, you cannot have the God kind of life. You can't have the joy, the peace that, that, that's, that's real. You have to get fake stuff to fill in the gaps, such as parties and drinking and uh, uh, immorality, sexual activity, drugs, et cetera, you name it, or even just working yourself crazy to make all the money you can and be accessible you can. You use all those things to try to fill in the gap that God is the only one that can feel real peace, real joy, and real love. God so loved the world, he didn't want to leave it at that, in that state, in that place. So God said this, one man's disobedience brought this condition on all mankind. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send one man and because of his obedience, Jesus Christ, if you believe because of his one obedience that he took your place and my place and the punishment of sin, separation from God, eternal death was placed on Jesus for you and I. If you believe that he died in your place, he died separated from God and physical death, that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus died for you and God raised him from the dead. God said, I'll satisfy judgment to be satisfied. I won't hold sin against you anymore. Those who accept these terms that I won't hold it against you anymore. I'll declare you restored to right standing with me. I'll impute. I'll give to you right standing. I'll make you righteous again. You'll be born again. No longer do you have a sin nature. You're not just forgiven of your sins when you accept these terms. God forgives you and he also restores you. He gives you a new nature, a new spirit. Your spirit becomes alive to him once again and you can have fellowship with him and you can experience his love, his peace, and his joy, not only now in this life, but for eternity. If you don't take these terms, there's one thing left, judgment. And you'll be judged right along with the other rebellious spirits and be sentenced to a time of eternal death in a place called hell where God is not. And that's why it's hell. So if you're ready to give your life to God right now, just pray this after me. Say, God, 
I believe and I'm convinced that I'm a sinner. I ask that you forgive me now and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And I purpose to change. I'm repenting to change whatever I need to change as you show me how I think, how I speak, my purposes, as well as my lifestyle. I ask that you would fill me now with your spirit in Jesus name. And I believe it's all possible that I can ask for this because I believe in my heart that Jesus died in my place and you raised him from the dead and he lives forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, welcome to the family, the family of God. Amen, no longer are you under the tyranny of the devil. Find you a good place, come back here to the Word Center. Find you a good word teaching church to go to so that you can grow up in the things of God. You ask, you pray that prayer with me. You ask God to fill you with his spirit. Expect the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with you and convince you of what's right and what's wrong. Expect the Holy Spirit to lead you and teach you and help you to understand the Bible. And also expect the Holy Spirit to begin to give you words. It's called speaking in tongues. He's going to give you a language, not out of your intellect, not something you learn, not something you rehearse or or figure out how to do. You just yield to the Holy Spirit. Take some time out when this video ends and begin to just thank God and worship him. God knows how to reveal it to you. He knows how to get it across to you. He will show you, amen, as you yield to him and give you the awesome gift of speaking in tongues, of praying in a language directly to God. So you'll be able to pray accurate prayers according to his will for you and for others, things you don't know you need to pray about or how to pray about it. And it's a wonderful life. You'll never, never, ever, ever regret it. You'll never be the same, amen. So take the things that we said today, meditate on them, study them, read them over and over, listen to this video over and over. Go to our website at iwordcenter.org O-R-G and uh, let's just click on look, searching for truth or go to the watch and listen page. We have other ministries there that we help, that we host and promote that will help you grow up in the things of God. So until next time, remember this, who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's me and that's you, that's you and that's me. So let's go out and learn how to walk in this thing, walk in love and see God do great things for you and your family and for others all to his glory. In Jesus' name, amen.